So you want to go to Cuba? Well, I'm here to share with you a few things you need to know before you go. Hi, I'm Dr. Michelle Scullock with My Stethoscope Travels. And on this channel, I review the latest medical recommendations for traveling to destinations around the world. We talk about what to do before you go, where to get medical care abroad, and tips on staying healthy while you travel so that you can boldly explore all the corners of the world. So if this is something that's interesting to you, then subscribe to my channel, tell the friends that you travel with, and be sure to hit the notification bell so that you'll know when I upload the next video. Welcome. I saw a video recently called Everything You Need to Know About Entering Cuba as an American in 2023 by Choose to Explore, and that gave us the ins and outs of getting there. I'm going to give you five medical tips for traveling to Cuba. Be sure to stay to the end because I will give you today's bonus know before you go tip. And remember, though I am board certified in internal medicine and a real doctor, I am not your doctor. So please discuss any concerns you have with your primary physician who knows your medical history best. Now, here are my five medical tips for traveling to Cuba. Number one, drink bottled water. In many areas, tap water is not drinkable and ice made from that tap water should not be consumed. When packing for your trip, you may want to go ahead and put a couple of bottles in your checked bag for when you arrive so you don't have to think about going to the grocery store initially. If you think you might forget, also take a plastic bag with you and use it to cover the faucet in the bathroom of your hotel or place that you're staying and place a bottle of water next to the faucet so that you remember when you're going to brush your teeth. One of the illnesses that might be encountered in Cuba from unsafe drinking water is typhoid, which is an infection that you get from bacteria and contaminated food and water. So in addition to drinking bottled water or drinking purified water, be sure to wash fresh fruits and vegetables in clean water or peel them and eat foods that are cooked thoroughly. If you consume dairy products, make sure they are pasteurized. Typhoid causes fever, stomach pain, and diarrhea, but fortunately it can be treated with appropriate antibiotics and prevent it with a vaccination. Which brings me to my next tip, number two, update your vaccinations. About a month before your trip, talk to your primary physician to confirm you're up to date on all of the routine vaccinations like tetanus, polio, measles, mumps, rubella, flu, COVID, in addition to a few that are specifically recommended for travel to Cuba. And those are typhoid, hepatitis A, and hepatitis B. The typhoid vaccine comes in two forms. It can be administered as a jab in the arm and that's effective for two years, or the typhoid vaccine can be prescribed in the form of a capsule that patients can pick up at the pharmacy and take at home every other day for a total of four doses. It's important to finish these at least a week before arriving in order to be the most effective. The capsules contain a live, but weakened strain of the bacteria. Because it is a live vaccine, it is not appropriate for people with a weakened immune system or for women who are pregnant or think they might be pregnant. For those who are able to take the live vaccine, it will offer protection against infection for, with typhoid for up to five years. So this one might be preferred for frequent travelers or for those who live a nomadic lifestyle. Many people who travel or eat out frequently may have received the hepatitis A vaccine in the past, and you may have already received the series of three hepatitis B vaccines also. If so, your doctor can help you determine whether or not a booster will be necessary. Number three, prevent bug bites. Mosquitoes carry illnesses. Common ones that we don't see in the U.S. as frequently are Zika, chikungunya, and dengue fever. Preventing mosquito bites with using a mosquito repellent is important in preventing these illnesses. Mosquito repellent should include either 20% DEET, picaridin, or oil of lemon eucalyptus. 
Travelers may also choose to wear clothes that have been treated with repellent by the manufacturer. You may be wondering, what are these illnesses and why do I care? Zika has been associated with severe birth defects in women who have become infected and pregnant or by their partners who have traveled for up to six months after the fact. Dengue fever can be quite serious also. In addition to feeling bad with fever, nausea, vomiting, muscle and joint aches, headache and eye pain, patients can develop severe bleeding and go into shock, causing damage to their organs. Symptoms usually begin two weeks after the bite, so be mindful of any symptoms that occur once you return home. There is limited availability of a vaccine to prevent dengue fever. It has been used in children, but recently approved and recommended for adults. So discuss with your physician whether this vaccine would be appropriate for you. Tip number four, take important medications with you. Bring all medications in their original packing. Your prescription medications should remain in the bottle dispensed by the pharmacy with a label that is clearly legible. And though I love, love, love to recommend the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday pill boxes to help patients remember um, to take their medications, pack an empty one of those and fill it once you arrive at your destination. Be sure to bring enough of your regular medications to last longer than your anticipated stay, at least an extra five to seven days. If there is a concern about whether a prescribed medication will be legal in Cuba, check with the General Customs Office of Cuba prior to arrival. And though medical care is available, there are shortages of basic medical supplies, including common over-the-counter medications. So bring these with you. And if you are going in support of the Cuban people, you may want to take extras to leave behind. Your list should include something for fever like Tylenol or its generic equivalent acetaminophen, something for inflammation in case you have a sprain or just walk a little bit more than you normally do, like Motrin or ibuprofen, a leave or its generic equivalent naproxen, a thermometer, your preferred antacid, medication for diarrhea like Imodium or Pepto-Bismol, an antihistamine like Benadryl, Claritin, Zyrtec, or Zizol, a cough suppressant, and an expectorant or cough drops, a decongestant if you're able to take those, a mild sedative or sleep aid if you're changing time zones and might have to deal with insomnia, saline nasal spray, face masks, and gloves. Again, unopened products can be donated and left behind. Number five, bring a first aid kit. A good first aid kit should include an antiseptic to cleanse accidental cuts and scrapes, an antibacterial ointment to prevent those roots from getting affected, and a number of other products. If you'd like my international packing list, which includes these, check the description box below. And though you may not put these in your kit, I would also recommend packing two more items, perhaps in your purse or your carry-on, and that is hand sanitizer and sunscreen, even for melanated people, because we can burn and develop skin cancer. Generally speaking, medical care in Cuba is very good and is provided to its citizens free of charge. Cuba does require visitors to have medical insurance that's not U.S. based, but this is usually included in your airline travel ticket for those flights originating in the U.S. So if you're a U.S. citizen visiting London and decide to fly to Cuba, for example, you would likely not be covered. But if you are a U.S. citizen and you're in Miami and purchase your ticket there uh, after deciding to go to Cuba, you would likely be covered. So the bonus medical tip, which I think is super important, is know how and where to get help. If you experience a medical emergency, dial 104 for an ambulance, 105 for fire, and 106 is for the police. 
be advised that ambulance services may not be available outside of Havana. There may be delays in service and keep in mind the shortages, so you may need to decide in the moment what's the safest and quickest way to get from point A to point B for medical assistance. The U.S. Embassy in Havana maintains a list of doctors and hospitals in the area. You can go to cu.usembassy.gov for the most up-to-date list. Insurance coverage extends to medically necessary services, otherwise travelers desiring medical care generally must pay cash. Lastly, I think no medical talk about Cuba would be complete without mentioning what happened to several U.S. Embassy employees in Havana. They experienced a number of physical symptoms, including hearing loss, dizziness, headaches, trouble processing information, difficulty sleeping, just to name a few, starting in the residences, but as well as at the Hotel Nacional and Hotel Capri in Havana. As a result, the U.S. Embassy in Havana continues to operate with reduced staffing as of this recording. To date, tourists have not been affected, but if you should experience these symptoms, do seek medical attention. So, these are my five, no six, medical tips for traveling to Cuba. Be sure to like and share this video with those that you're traveling with, and let me know in the comments where else you're planning to go. I'd love to know the places you'd like to know more about. So until next time, fellow travelers, safe travels. Bye-bye.